Hey, I'm Mr. Terry, high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, we've got a big one for you today. This video comes from the Salmonella Academy and the title is The Presidential Assassination Nobody Talks About. That's interesting. So I'm assuming it does not JFK or Lincoln, probably the two biggest, most famous assassinations. So I don't know where they're going with this. We go McKinley, Garfield, for heaven's sake. I don't know. I'm excited to check this out. Now this video is super popular. It has over 12 million views in the last three years. So I must have been sleeping on this one. All right, the original video link is down below. Make sure to support the original video and the content creator there. Also, while you're down there, you might see some links to some stuff they also might be interested in. All right, let's get started. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Thank you, Skillshare. Skillshare has been a great supporter of my channel, so I love their supporting historical stuff on the internet. Hey kids, John Wilkes Booth, hey. Lee Harvey Oswald, Hitler, all people Assassins. who gained massive yeah. notoriety by killing one of history's famous leaders, but there Hitler are two Americans who committed an equally heinous crime as these three, yet their stories are seldom remembered, mostly because nobody really cares about the presidents they killed. Originally I was going to talk about both of them, but the video ended up being way too long, so today we'll just stick to uh, this one I guess. Charles J. Guiteau was a pretty silly guy, okay. and to understand how a guy could be so silly, you I wonder if he was originally saying if he was talking about assassins or assassinated, like for the United States, if it was McKinley and uh, um, Garfield or something. But it looks like we're going down the road of the assassins. Let's start with his youth. Guito was born in Freeport, Illinois in 1841. I don't his know who this guy is. His mom had postpartum psychosis and died when he was seven, alongside oh three of his five siblings. His dad, meanwhile, was mega religious and made a big point out of instilling those values in his son, often physically. This influence yeah, molded go well. Charles into a boy who sought nothing that short of total well. approval from others and who would react very harshly to any criticism levied upon him. As a teen... That is a social makeup for people that are going to be potentially dangerous in a way. Um, if you want to constantly be getting approval, then what you're going to do is just kiss your butt to the way to the top and uh, just constantly have to like reinvent yourself with the approval of others. Um, that's one thing that can happen. And he moved to Ann Harbor, Michigan for high school. He tried to get into the University of Michigan, <laughs> but he goofed on the entrance exam. So he did what... What? His entrance exam? Ann Arbor is uh, University of Michigan Wolverines, not Harbor. I am the big dumb for high school. Okay, what did he you try to get into the University of Michigan? But he goofed on the entrance. What is the capital of Michigan? <laughs> M. <laughs> M city. Uh, if your mother gave you five 10 cent pieces, <clears throat> seven five cent pieces, and 12 one cent pieces, how much money would you have? My mom's dead. LOL. <laughs> Sorry, bud, you're not Entrance getting exam. in. So he did what anyone in his situation would do and said, well, so much for real life. I'm going to join a commune. Specifically, oh, he became part of the Oneida community in New York. In some aspects, this place okay. was a pretty run-of-the-mill religious fellowship. From each according to their ability, to each according, according to, their, to need, their need, yada, yada. Well, that's but there communist were a couple of things right that made there. it special. First off, they followed a doctrine known as Christian talk. perfectionism, whereby everyone oh, no. would strive to live their lives completely free of sin and reach a divine level of perfection while still on Earth. Now this isn't all right. The perfectionist religions where you're trying to achieve perfection, all that does is going to create a whole society of people that will constantly be depressed and anxious and never fulfilled in their life. And that could cause a lot of problems because you will constantly for somebody that needs approval all the time. If you live in a place like that, that is going to destroy you psychologically really unique to Oneida, but whereas most people would achieve this through staunch discipline and careful self-reflection, these guys would just get together and take turns roasting the shit out of each and every member stupid. over any minute flaw saying. they could possibly have. Real great for the psyche. They also practice what was- Because then it becomes a competition in a place like that, who is the closest to perfect? So you just put out each other's flaws to raise you up. Basically an early form of eugenics, where aspiring parents would have to submit an application and be judged by the committee on their moral and spiritual fortitude. If they were allowed to mate, children would be separated from the mom about a year after birth and raised communally in the children's wing. Wait, the parents after don't all, raise them? wouldn't want any of those hopelessly flawed toddlers to think they're deserving of any affection oh, whatsoever. No. Oneida also believed in okay, what they- Okay, anybody growing up in that is gonna be bleeped up. So you're not even raised by your parents, you're raised by the commune? Is that what they're saying? Or are they saying if the parents are worthy behaviorally and whatever in the eyes of the religious group there, that they can 
have the children, but if they have a child and the parents are not worthy, so then they would take them away. Either way, it's going to be kind of a rough upbringing. They called free love, which meant that anyone could bang anyone at any time, as long as they kept it hetero. And exclusive relationships of any kind were actually frowned upon, which Wait. seems like kind of a weird habit for people trying to 100% FC this whole Christianity thing, but whatever. But wait. Wait, 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 wait. This is a commune of people that were like, I mean, they said the other thing about this, like pure Christian living and getting rid of the sinful behavior, but then they're all just like hooking up all the time. It's amazing how these like cult groups, we probably, I guess we should call it what it is, have amazing abilities to compartmentalize their beliefs. Even if, you know, at such extreme extremes where it's like, it will, um, it will be like contradictory to other things and hypocritical. Okay, whatever. I mean, whatever. Maybe they're just woke. Well, you know. It, it, You're saying we'll how can you have selective breeding? But they at seem the same repressive time in so many other ways. Extremely unselective breeding. Aha! See, that's where male <laughs> continence comes in. Oh. Under this rule, a pair could go at it for as long as they wanted, with the caveat that the dude's not allowed to nut, pull out, or otherwise. That way, it's not a sin. After all, as the Bible says, if the dick don't spit, you must acquit. Paradoxically, no such rule existed for the women. In fact. What Bible verse could possibly say that? All right, this video just turned into not, not safe for work. If you were watching this at work, I, I apologize, I guess. This is a live reaction, so I didn't know that that was a thing. Uh, this just got higher in maturity level. I don't know if I can watch, so I'll just kind of like... We'll just kind of not only do the commune believe in female orgasms they actually prioritize them which is like unheard of in the 19th century they even have the middle-aged women of the society uh, train no, the no, teen I boys in the art of holding in the old pelvic sneeze oh. that way there wouldn't be any <laughs> chance of conception in case the guy goofs up his first few tries so anyway young gito joins this whole thing and endured countless oh, no. blows to his massive yet fragile ego thinking he's at least going to get a piece of this communal action except the criticism towards him wasn't just a formality like it was for others. Everyone there genuinely fucking hated him <laughs> on account of the fact that he was a raving neurotic narcissist. Oh, he gosh. never caught a single piece of this allegedly free love. And after a while... Well, okay, and for somebody that wants to be... Or somebody that has the personality of wanting to be uh, acknowledged by others, that would probably be awful for him. And is either going to try really hard to get into this group or completely try to leave and get his own group. They all started calling him Charles Get Out in the hopes that he'd leave. <laughs> this is real. Gitto, and after out. five long years of this abuse, Gitto finally got the hint and moved to New Jersey. He tried starting a newspaper themed around the Oneida religion called the Daily Theocrat, except nobody cared. Is he trying so to that promote failed. them? He like, went get back, back in their Oneida races? and tried to sue the place in order to get back oh. pay for all his voluntary unpaid labor while living there. But apparently I'm mad butthurt isn't a valid reason for prosecution, <laughs> so that went nowhere. You know what? <laughs> just to add to that like what they're saying about like lawsuits and stuff a lot of these commune groups have these type of legal issues like uh polygamists like polygamous communes um i i have heard how like you know you get into the group and then what they want you to do is add to the community right especially with like land something you can bring economically so what they would have you do is you go in and then you need to, you're responsible for going in and like acquiring land, getting loans and stuff like that, putting them in your name. But then this is where they can screw you over. They'll, you'll do that, right? You take all the risk, but the land will said, okay, the land though is going to belong to the commune, right? The whole, the whole group. However, if that land fails and this is what happens sometimes, you took the, the fall for it. Not the group, even though the profits go to the group, but you take the risk um, and you don't get much out of it. And that's how they fleece a lot of these people in some of these types of like cult-like groups. Finally said, well, when your devotion to God has failed you, there's only one path in life left. Time to become a lawyer. He managed to pass an examination to gain admission even get into to the school. Illinois bar and subsequently joined a law firm in Chicago at the age of 27, oh. where he met his soon-to-be okay. wife, one Annie Bunn. Of course, Guiteau never really got to be a lawyer. He only argued in one actual <laughs> court case. Most of his time was spent doing <laughs> bill collection for random clients. Oh, this great. job gave him insight into how goon? debtors think and operate, which allowed him to turn into quite the con man, dodging bills 
doesn't make Whenever sense. and wherever you know he the, saw the opportunity. Even on the job, he'd frequently charge exorbitant contingency fees after the fact, upwards of 75%. And sometimes wow. he'd just keep it all and completely ghost his clients. After oh, all, man. what are they going to do? Send another bill collector? Well, it turns out they did. So Guiteau and his wife fled to New just York. Got out of a he commune that started was getting into politics. Him. Specifically, he wrote and delivered a speech in favor of Horace Greeley, the 1872 okay. Democratic presidential candidate. And he somehow got it in his head that if Greeley won, his campaign would be so greatly indebted to him that they'd fulfill his desires to be the Gonna Minister the of Chile. As though a total rando like him could just, you know, name a job and it would be his. In reality, the speech was That's an incoherent mess heard by next to no one. And <laughs> All I would just say, dear everyone, Greeley is a good boy. You vote for him. He'll beat up every other country's dad, and then we'll be the best country. The other guy is a dirty fellow. He's got a brain like a used loofah and a pee-pee like a greasy salamander. Also, I'm selling my Jordans because they don't fit anymore. Best offer goes. Love, little Charlie guitar. Oh, Greeley, yeah, Greeley he's gonna lost get, by oh, a landslide. As the years passed, Annie got real sick of living life on the run with a broke SP. And Charles was none too keen on her weighing him down either. But back in the day, you couldn't just divorce someone willy-nilly. You needed a valid reason for it. So Charles concocted the brilliant scheme of she banging a prostitute and then having her testify in court. The plan worked, with okay. the pair successfully divorcing in 1874. And the only do? downside was syphilis. Whoops. Uh. Guiteau started <laughs> dabbling in theology again around was this it time. Worth it, bro? He published a book called The Truth, which was almost entirely plagiarized directly from John Noyes, the founder of the Oneida community. But oh, despite geez. being a man of God, Guiteau was still very much a two-time environment and moved frequently phony. in the dead of night to keep collectors off his tail. His brother caught wind of this and wrote him a letter basically saying, Hey, uh, maybe you should pay your bills now and then so you can be, you know, a functioning member of society. <laughs> to which Charles replied, and I quote, Find seven dollars enclosed. Stick it up your bunghole and wipe your nose on it, and that will remind you of the estimation in which you are held by Charles J. Guiteau. God Yo, damn. And to his own brother. Wouldn't everyone just like to, I guess, throw that to the IRS? Just pretty much add this note to your uh, tax return. The madman. <laughs> Soon after he got arrested, bailed out by his sister, lived with her for a few months, attacked her with an axe, yeah, went to DC, rambled okay. about religion to anyone who would listen, He's moved to Boston, the, oh, got either. in a boat Ooh. accident where everyone in his boat was fine, but everyone in the other one fucking died, <laughs> took this as a sign from God, moved what? back to New York, and got back into politics in 1880, this a time as a Republican. Sign? During this campaign, there were two main factions of Republicans, known as the Stalin warts in the half breed this is an interesting part of the like some history of the republican party as uh political parties are going to have to kind of pick sides because in 1880 the second industrial revolution begins and the republican party kind of becomes the party of of like the bigger business um interesting time political history that way and shit, wish we had names like that today. Now, Guiteau considered himself a stalwart, and in a similar vein to his 1872 <laughs> venture, he wrote a speech to promote stalwart candidate Ulysses S. Grant, who was shooting for his third term. But before he got a chance to deliver the you speech, could do that back one then. James nope, A. Garfield no took the candidacy completely out of nowhere, beating out both factions single-handedly. He was uh, like, rats, okay, how many power handed to me now? So he literally just scribbled out all the references to Grant and replaced them with Garfield and was like, yep, that'll do it. He wait, 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 we gotta read it. So we may concern, and as they're crossing out Grant, James A. Garfield <coughs> is the co the finest candidate you ever saw. My favorite Garfield moment is when he led the Republican army to victory in the civil election. <laughs> it would be irresponsible, frankly, to do anything but Garfield him the presidency. <laughs> that doesn't even make sense. Your pal. It's a, wait, shit. <laughs> <laughs> really just scribbled out all the references to Grant and replaced them with oh, Garfield Sam, and was funny. like, yep, that'll do it. He read this speech all of twice, along with handing out copies to the Republican National Committee. In reality, this really didn't accomplish much, but when Garfield managed to win the election, Guiteau was like, yes, that was entirely me. Garfield is in my supreme debt. As God is my witness, he shall make me a you, consulate bro. in Vienna or Paris or someplace cool like that. He went to D.C. to await his inevitable appointment 
disappointment, but obviously nothing happened. So he started writing letters, a lot of letters. When that didn't work, he started actually stalking both Garfield and the Secretary of State, James Blaine, intercepting them in hotel lobbies, just being like, oh, hey, yeah, it's me, the sole person responsible for your success. Say, how about a consulship? (laughs) All right, you'll get back to me, I get it. Whoa, (laughs) what a coincidence, me again. How's that consulship coming? At first, they simply ignored him, but eventually Blaine snapped, screaming, never speak to me again on the Paris consulship as long as you live. Oh, Damn you, Garfield! <laughs> the cat's a disturbance in the forest. The kids know about Garfield Maybe the cat. daylight savings just made Monday an hour longer. Wow, Garfield, that Monday. was quite the wisecrack. It's Odie. amazing how you managed to keep things fresh year oh. after year. Burn in hell, beige dog. At this point, Guito <laughs> completely renounced any faith in the current administration, and after a lifetime of clout chasing met only with disappointment, he decided he his only option was straight up going postal. He convinced himself man. that it was now God's will to remove Garfield from this mortal plane in order to put his stalwart we'll vice president, it, Chester Alan Arthur, into power. When he went to buy a revolver, he was given the choice between a wood grip and an ivory grip. He went with the ivory one for no other reason than he thought it would look cooler in a museum, and on July July 2nd, 1881, he ambushed Garfield at the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Station, shooting him twice in the back and mortally wounding him, all because he wouldn't give him a job. Garfield managed to hang on for 11 weeks before finally dying, which sounds like hell. Today's modern physicians actually believe that Garfield could have easily survived the incident if it weren't for doctors digging through him with unsanitized tools. Hey, modern medicine, thanks for not being They're worse than literally fix that no after medicine. The Civil War. It means a lot. But that didn't stop Guito from being formally charged with murder. And that that's exactly what he wanted. Matter of fact, Guito was over the moon, taking his new nationwide infamy as the fame he always deserved. Wow. His trial was just bananas, with Guito hurling obscenities at just about everyone there, including <laughs> his Genshin. own defense team, and formatting his testimony as an epic poem, which he recited in full. He even dictated oh, an geez. autobiography to the New York Herald, which, get this, he ended with a personal ad for a nice Christian lady under 30 years of age. What a baller. When the guilty verdict was read, he called everybody there low con consummate jackasses and you heard of that thing though where like murderers will get like love letters in prison from people like there's people that are like really into that so it it might have worked for him but it looks like it's not gonna go well because i see a gallo here and a noose. On June 30th, 1882, Guito smiled and waved to his adoring fans as he was walked to the gallows, where he recited a repetitive, deranged poem he wrote that morning, which was performed in a high-pitched falsetto voice, <laughs> since it was written in the point of view of a child. He asked for a full oh, orchestra to play during the reading, weird. which I don't have to tell you that went nowhere. And it's promptly so thereafter, he was hung. When the gallows dropped, people were probably like, ugh, Jesus, it's finally over. I just came here for a nice little execution. They subject me to all that. Oh, my money back frankly. <laughs> so it just goes to show, you can't always get what you want. Unless that thing is getting everyone to hate you, that's extraordinarily easy. But for everything else, you're gonna need a combination of hard work True. and know-how. While the former must ultimately come from within, there's plenty of resources out there for the latter. The best of which is a seldom talked about little startup called Skillshare. Sponsor time. Well, Skillshare is an online now. learning community with over 25,000 classes in design, business, Love technology, uh, and more. So Premium many, membership gives you uh, unlimited access to high quality classes on most no Topics so you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do the work you love. A wise philosopher once said that the most fulfilling pursuit in life is to get to know oneself. Nah, I just made that up. Sounds legit though, right? Now, mindfulness and meditation are all well and good, but how about drawing a self discovery? Sounds hokey, but I can tell you that I've certainly learned a lot about myself over the years doing this thing, so I'm sure you will too. Join the more than 7 million people already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for my viewers. Everyone who visits the link in the description can get two months of unlimited access to the 25,000 plus classes on Skillshare for absolutely free. So please release that tension and get that comprehension today. Anyway, that's all for today. Till next time, I'm Sam and Ella. And I oop and I oop. <laughs> I love the high class music to accompany it. All right, let's wrap this up. That was awesome. I had no idea about the story of the assassin himself that assassinated president Garfield. And that was a crazy life story from like beginning being, you know, uh, going into uh, having those issues, you know, growing up and then going into the crazy, like Christian cult thing and warping him and making him even crazier. And then all that stuff. So like, 
That was nuts to hear about that. That's one of the most uh, uh, interesting backstories I've heard of assassins. So many of them just have like political motivations or something that um, like that, like uh, Lee Harvey Oswald or um, John Wilkes Booth or something like that. But this dude was kind of just nuts. And again, was trying to like just ride the coattails of fame there and then getting rejected for jobs just made his life meaningless pretty much. So that was crazy, but that was a fantastic video. Yeah, sorry if you're getting not safe for work trouble there. Um, I'm sure Sam will uh, uh, come and apologize to you personally. <laughs> Nevertheless, though, uh, that was a lot of fun to watch. And hopefully you liked it. If you stuck around this long, thank you. The original video link is down below, as well as some links to some other fun stuff. Gaming channel, some fun history merch, things you might be interested in, so you might want to take a look over there. All right, and with that, we'll see you next time. Bye.